Welcome, I'm Nelifa. This is Dear World Live. How do we uh, construct our economy in a way that is climate friendly? It's two times as difficult for disabled people dealing with COVID than it is for their non-disabled peers. How do we actually ensure women's inclusion? How do we ensure women's safety? Hi and welcome, it's me Nelifa. This is a very special edition of Dear World Live from Doha Debates as part of the World Innovation Summit for Health. In this season of Dear World Live, we're focusing on race and racism across the world. Each week we focus on a different aspect of this very important conversation. Today we're talking about how racial inequality impacts the, the difference in healthcare standards that people across the world receive. My wonderful guests today are Dr. Motsadiso Moyeti, Doreen Maracha, and Dr. Cameron Abasi, who will be joining me soon. But first, I want to start this discussion by framing it in the context of the coronavirus pandemic, which has exposed existing racial healthcare inequalities. In the United States, Latino and African American people are three times as likely to become infected with COVID 19 as their white neighbors and they're almost twice as likely to die from the disease. In the UK, the story is reflected where the death rate of people from black, Asian and minority ethnic groups is 1.5 to two times higher than those of white people. These facts are from places where there is an abundance of data to help us illustrate the problem, but healthcare racial inequalities are a truly worldwide issue. And it's not the first time we face a global health crisis. In the 1980s, HIV was a global epidemic that affected millions of people, and not everyone had access to the same quality of treatment. As we'll hear during today's show, this is one area of treatment we have got a lot better at. But for now, it's clear that globally, minority communities are likely to be most at risk from COVID. In fact, in Australia, some indigenous communities have taken strict self-protection measures by preemptively limiting contact with the general population. We'll talk more about this, but first we put the call out to our friends at the Shared Studio Network and asked if you've experienced healthcare inequalities in your life. We got one particularly powerful story and answer from Lewis Lee, a restorative justice advocate and outreach coordinator for the Milwaukee Fatherhood Initiative in the US, which provides skilled training for formerly incarcerated fathers returning to their communities. Here's his response when asked if he has experienced healthcare inequality. When I was 18 years old, I was a shooting victim. I was shot five times and the mother of my children called the ambulance, the ambulance came, rushed me to the hospital. I thought when I got to the hospital that I would get like A1 service because I was a shooting victim. I thought they would like really take my examination and my care real serious, but unfortunately they didn't. I think a lot of that had to do with the color of my skin, the actual neighborhood I was from, and just the actual income that I had. I believe a lot of times um, African-American people, especially males, uh, when we get rushed to hospital, we don't get the uh, quality service that we deserve. I was kind of given a rush job and rush out of the hospital straight into the arms of the MPD and straight to the county jail infirmary where it took me four months to heal and get back to my uh, normal self. So uh, I felt that was kind of racist and I felt that if I had been white that I would have got a uh, better service. Had I came from the suburbs, I would have got way better service. They would have took my case a little more serious. Very powerful story there from Lewis Lee and something that I want to reflect on. But this is Dear World Life and it's nothing without your involvement. For our regular viewers, you know the score. We depend on your comments, on your engagement with the show. Are we asking the right comments, uh, questions? Do you have any comments? Is there anything that you want to see in the show that we haven't talked about yet? For those of you who are watching at the World Innovation Summit for Health, 
get involved. Take out your phones and tell us what you make of the show so far. We are at Doha Debates on Twitter and all the various other social channels. For now, why don't you just tell me where you are watching from and what your name is. I will feature as many of your comments in the show as I can. So without any further ado, it's time to introduce our wonderful guests. Dr. Matsudiso Moyeti is the first woman to be elected as Regional Director for Africa for the World Health Organization. Doreen Muracha is a young woman living with HIV from Kenya and the founder of I Am A Beautiful Story and a campaigner to end the stigma of HIV and AIDS. Dr. Cameron Abaki is a physician and writer and the executive editor of the British Medical Journal and editor of the Journal of the Royal Society of Medicine. And we are grateful to be joined by our wonderful student. Khadija Owusu is a final year medical student here in the United Kingdom and founding member of the charity Melalin Medics. I am so grateful to have you all on the show. I want to start with my guests, Dr. Mietti and Dr. Abasi. I have a couple of questions for you guys specifically. So COVID-19 has already shown the inequalities in healthcare that people might experience based on their race. My question is, do you think everyone in the world is going to get equal access to the COVID-19 vaccine, two of which have, uh, are hopefully going to be coming to market before the end of this year? Are people going to get equal access to the vaccine? But also, will that access have anything to do with racial inequalities? Dr. Moyeti, let me start with you. Okay. Um, thank you very much. And first, I'm really thrilled to be part of this panel. And what, what a great group of panelists. Uh, and back at the WISH, where I, which I attended a couple of years ago in person. So it's, it's a very exciting moment for me. Uh, yes, the emergence of the two vaccine candidates that are promising in phase three trials has really encouraged us all. Uh, it's true we need to wait for full efficacy and safety data to be available, but uh, we're all gearing up to, to make sure exactly that uh, there is equitable distribution. And coming from Africa, I have to say our experience in the past has been that when a new technology comes out, African countries are kind of at the back of the queue to get it. And we've seen that sometimes it takes a decade for a new technology to be available in Africa in a scaled up fashion in the health systems. So coming back to this vaccine, this was thought about as the development of the vaccine was happening and a coalition was established at the global level to guard against inequity in the distribution of the vaccine, the WHO and Gavi, um, and both low-income, middle-income countries and some upper-income countries who are partners and contributing financially, just to that very aim to have equity. However, we've seen that um, wealthy countries, uh, mainly Western countries, are entering into advanced purchase agreements with vaccine manufacturers to reserve doses. So from the African perspective, we are very concerned, but are also hoping that we hold to this principle of um, equity and that we don't have deals being entered into which countries which will then sweep up the, the supplies and stop. We're hoping for at least initially 20% of populations to be covered in Africa, starting with the most vulnerable. Now, turning to Western countries where you've, I, I think you've said very well, that uh, black people, Af people of African origin, other minorities are disproportionately affected. We hope very much that when these countries prioritize who's going to get the vaccine first, they will genuinely look at those who are worst affected and that we do not have one inequality based on geography, income level of countries, and also uh, racial inequality. As far as Africa is concerned, of course, we have the possibility for both. But it's our hope that the, the COVAX facility which uh, WHO has put in place as part of uh, a coalition for equity at the global level will reduce the chances of inequitable access. Dr. Moyeti, thank you so much for that eloquent answer. I can sense the concern in your voice. You're being very diplomatic about it and I respect and appreciate that. Dr. Abati, if I might come to you, do I mean, what does history teach us? Do we think that this new COVID vaccine, the hope that is, is, is riding with it, all of our collective wish that it's successful, do you think that will be dispensed equitably? Okay, uh, welcome. Uh, good, good, to, good to speak to you today. Um, 
can I just say um, I don't need to be diplomatic here um, because I don't work for the World Health Organization. <laughs> um, I think we have uh, two problems. I mean, first of all, there is the kind of the hope around the vaccine. We all want the vaccine to be to be effective, to save lives, um, uh, and to be equally distributed. Um, first of all, we don't really know whether any of these vaccines work as well as we want them to, whether they're going to save lives. We haven't seen the data. So yeah, there's optimism, but it's a bit unfounded at the moment, should we say. Uh, but let's assume that we do have a vaccine at some point uh, available next year. I'm afraid the lesson from history, from our experience is that, um, uh, these things are not equitably distributed. Um, and I think my fear is that on this occasion, everything will be much worse because for one simple reason. Uh, and the reason is this, that um, we, this will be an unprecedented um, delivery rollout vaccination program uh, in the history of, of, of humanity. We've never mm -hmm. done anything on this scale before. Um, and so if you pitch yourself into that scenario, what you will inevitably find is that whatever disparities exist, discrimination exists, inequalities exist, they will be heightened and exacerbated uh, uh, when we start rolling, rolling the vaccine out, which is a very good reason for WHO and others to put together mm -hmm. this coalition that, that we call COVAX for, for fair distribution of the vaccine. But my concern is that that isn't going to happen the rich countries are going to prioritize their own political agendas uh, to serve their populations. Uh, and unfortunately, we will not get the rollout to poorer countries that we should get. And all that will happen is this will be another example of how inequality is, is, is exacerbated. Do you not find what you're saying right now incredibly egregious Dr Abarasi the fact that you're telling the truth we both know you're right um and yet um, there's little that can be done about well, it no, not the, well no I do I mean it's very disturbing we cover these issues on a daily basis in the BMJ and it's I mean it's, it's scandalous it's horrific it's a reality that we face and these are the things that we need to change through collective will through leadership through determination uh, but unfortunately what we have is we have certain regimes in the world, should we say, who aren't, you know, thinking globally and, and, and things may have changed with elections. Uh, uh, but but we need we need the world to come together. Uh, we need solidarity. We need countries to work together. We need the leading nations in terms of influence to come yeah. together and, and share things equ equitably. Absolutely. Uh, at this point, I would like to thank all of the guests who are joining us. It seems that we might have lost the connection with Doreen Maracha, but we, I will try and get that as, uh, up as soon as possible. And as soon as we have Doreen, she can add such insight into how we can learn from lessons in history. For now, those of you who are watching, welcome to Dear World Live. I'm Nella Fahidayat. This is a production brought to you by Doha Debates. I would like to spend some time thanking you guys for tuning in from Sudan, Khartoum, uh, Mohdi, Hello to you, uh, Dr. Govinda Clayton, a fan of the show, watching from Zurich. Uh, we've got people from Sierra Leone in West Africa, Mohammed Marha, thank you for joining. Nigeria, a Nigerian in Doha. Hello, Jamila, good to see you. And in fact, Kadnan in uh, Mogadishu in Somalia, Mohammed in Qatar, you are all very welcome. Tell me your comments and your questions. Do you think that the COVID-19 virus vaccine will be distributed equitably around the world and when it comes to uh, racial equality. Okay, I wanna move on slightly and bring in our wonderful uh, uh, student, Khadija. Khadija, hello, you are a student of medicine right now. You invented or you, you, you co-created Melanin Medics. First of all, why did you do it? What was the need and what does it do? Thank you. Um, first of all, I do want to say thank you for having me on the show. It's honestly a privilege to be amongst these amazing guests. Um, but yes, I co-founded a charity called Melanin Medics, um, set up by one of my good friends, Alana Zaydada, as well. And Melanin Medics essentially is a non-profit organisation, a registered charity that aims to widen aspirations as well as promote diversity in medicine and aid career progression. So we 
basically thought that, okay, representation in medicine is one of the key issues that exist, especially in the UK. And that's the reason why we set up the charity in order to combat some of the issues. So I guess m m my other point is, mm -hmm. as a black woman yourself, when you've ever had to access healthcare, uh, whether it's in a hospital, whether it's uh, reproductive health or GP surgery, a general practitioner surgery, do you feel it? Do you sense it as, as a person? I just want to try and get a sense of your experience. Yeah, no, definitely. So for me personally, it would more so be on the other side as somebody that is providing the healthcare for patients. Um, of course, within limited capacity, as I am still a student. But you do often see these um, inequalities play out. Um, a lot of these biases that are inherent in amongst various healthcare professionals, whether it be related to, you know, we know about the maternal mortality amongst black women and white women. We also know about black people being less likely to prescribe um, adequate pain medication, as well as, you know, with COVID-19 being more likely to um, die from COVID if you are from a black and ethnic minority background. So as somebody who's a healthcare provider and seeing you, of course Thank it is you. not good Khadija. to work. Thank you. I, I'm going to come to uh, your question for our wonderful guests, but I think we have Doreen back. Can I just test the wonders of internet magic? Is Doreen here? You have left me on Kenya hooks, Doreen. Let me tell you that. It's good to see you, my love. Are you in Kenya right now? Yes, I'm in Kenya. Okay, so I'll keep it nice and short just because the connection is tenuous. Doreen, okay. you... Mm -hmm. Uh, you've been dealing with the public health issue of HIV and AIDS and the epidemic that's run rampant around the world since the 80s. My question to you is very specific. You're based in Kenya and you've lived with HIV since I believe 1992. Here's the, here's the thing. How did your access in Africa, in Kenya, of HIV treatment compare to those who were trying to access it in the global north, here in maybe London where I live? <laughs> So uh, for us, you know, uh, living with HIV, when, when I was first diagnosed in 1999, there was no medication. So I was, my parents were just told, take her home and uh, just wait, wait upon the Lord because there was no, re no hope that I was going to live to this place point like to 2020 so uh as time went by medication came came uh the airways came around 2001 2002 but they were very expensive so they were not accessible for everybody so still we were not able to afford them until 2005 when they were made free for everybody then i was able to access medication and uh that is when i started medication so for 13 years of my life i was not on any medication we call we use these very evocative words um just just as a lay person i mean i i i now know what the difference between a pandemic and an epidemic is but we use these words and we think you know oh gosh this sounds terrible but for 13 years during you didn't have access to medication that you needed that the world had what does it make you feel and think when you when you think about the potential for the for these two new COVID-19 vaccines, do you think they will be dispensed correctly around the world? Do you think the continent of Africa will have access in the same way that, the, that Europe does? I have my reservations. I feel like uh, Africa might be left behind just the same way it was left behind before or uh, during uh, the HIV epidemic because we have seen all through, uh, even to a point that uh, when medication came, when the first uh, batch of ARVs we had were very harsh to our bodies, and we were not really given a choice because when we went to hospital to complain, I remember one time the doctor told me, it's either you take the medication or you don't take them and die. So you have to just live with the side effects. So with the new COVID-19 vaccine, I, vaccines, the two vaccines, I kind of feel like, Africa might again be left behind or we might be brought something that might not work on us or might not work well on us. And then we will be forced with the choice of you just have to deal with it. You just have to live with it. Uh, it's either you live with it or you just don't take it and you die. So those are usually not very, very 
uh, appropriate choices to make, but then because you have to choose life, so you choose the, the only available option that you have. Because when I went to hospital and told my doctor, my, I'm experiencing all these side effects. She told me, you just have to take them. It's, you don't have a choice. It's either that or death. And that is not usually a very easy choice. Doreen, incredibly powerful report there. Just, an, just, just what you're saying is very hard to hear. But I want to bring in someone who can make a difference. Regional Director for Africa in the past with the World Health Organization, Dr. Mayeti, when you hear Doreen, a citizen of Kenya, of the African continent, what responsibility do you feel to make sure that the outcome uh, of, of, of or, the, or the distribution of these COVID-19 vaccines are equitable so Doreen doesn't feel like this? Yeah, thanks. Uh, actually, Doreen, just to let you know, I've spent about a third of my life working on HIV and exactly on access to, to antiretroviral drugs. In fact, I was the leader of that work. There was a, an initiative by WHO called 3 by 5 So I know exactly what you're talking about, how painful it was. And I worked on HIV in my country, Botswana, and that at the pre-treatment days, it was extremely painful. And yeah. so I, I think that... We need action on several fronts. You know, you, you showed in, there was a clip in the film of some men, I think that was in Manhattan, demonstrating and marching. It, it looked like a U.S. city. So in addition to this, this um, coalition of, of uh, like-minded countries that I was talking about, which includes some European Union countries, some Asian countries, Latin American countries, as well as virtually all the African countries in hope, I think what's needed, so we need that kind of initiative to push. So my staff and I with partners are doing all our best to persuade the African countries to go for it, go looking for the money. Let's have a pooled approach so that we constitute a market that's going to be competing. I mean, understanding very much all, all the, the, the bad history and experiences, including around HIV. And, and then we're working with the countries to get ready now. So in fact, we are doing an assessment of their readiness and preparing to roll out the vaccine in terms of all the logistics, the technical work that needs to be done. I do think one of the best experiences from the HIV era was the solidarity among people. Yeah. Uh, indeed, and at the moment, you know, COVID-19 has become very political, as we know, much more than HIV did. You know, governments are falling or rising based on what their population think, how well their populations think they've done on HIV. I remember groups of American gay men with HIV hounding a certain head of state everywhere he tried to speak because they, they, they perceived that uh, rich countries didn't care. They weren't doing anything to the pharmaceutical sector to deal with fair, fair pricing. That, that head of state could hardly speak at a conference. Everywhere he walked in, there were people, no, you don't get the space until you do something about this. So I think if we could work at different levels, these kind of coalitions and partnerships, and get people to be the force to overcome the reticence of their governments, the kind of... Uh, nationalism that we do see politically on, on the international level, that would make a huge difference. What we are looking for in WHO with my colleagues and partners is the resourcing, the partners, the NGOs on the ground to work with people so that uh, the experience that has just been described does not become the reality with this situation. Doreen, Dr. Mietti, thank you so much. Um, and again, feel free to talk to each other on the show. This is Dear World Live. We are live. We're, for as long as we have Doreen, we will come to her. But for now, I'd like to go back to Khadija. And in fact, I would like all of my guests on the screen at the same time, if I might have them. There you all are. Wonderful. So Khadija, um, this is the part of the discussion, folks, where we can talk to each other. Feel free to talk to each other without my interference. We've got wonderful comments and questions coming in from our viewers at Wish and online, wherever they're streaming. And it's now time to have a bigger discussion. Khadija, why don't you kick us off? Do you have a question for our guests? For whom yeah, is sure. this and what is your question? Sure. So um, my question is essentially, you know, we know with the coronavirus pandemic that it has um, highlighted key issues, especially relating to institutional racism that exists in many systems across the world. And my question is, do you think the coronavirus pandemic has essentially worsened the racial inequality that exists or it simply just exposed what is already there? 
I mean, I could answer that to begin with, if you like, uh, Nilofer. I mean, uh, Khadija, thank you for the question. I think the, the, the answers are very simple. It has exposed it uh, to a wider audience than previously, um, uh, public than previously, but also it's made it worse. Um, as we were saying, pre you know, uh, the health system is stressed. Every health system is stressed. Uh, they're under pressure. And at times like that, inequalities, unfairness, becomes worse and unfortunately this it's made much worse uh, in this pandemic because much of the workforce the people exposed uh, trying to save lives trying to get you to work are from ethnic minorities and minority communities and it's the frontline people who have the greatest mm -hmm. exposure uh, and the people in the poorest communities who are often minority communities who are then uh, uh, unfortunately suffering the worst outcomes so Yes, uh, to both your questions, it's exposed it more and it's made it worse. Mm. Dr. Moyeti, yeah, please. If, uh, sure, if, if, if I may come in as well, uh, I, I agree very much uh, with what was just said. And then also, you know, because the, the COVID-19 pandemic has had a huge economic impact, huge and immediate, both at the level of individuals, the livelihoods, households, and uh, countries' economies. So I think not only has it, ha has it uh, highlighted inequities, not only has it uh, worsened them, but it's going to worsen them going into the future. So for those people, for example, in, in the inequitable systems that we have around the world who do not have uh, medical insurance, and certainly for people who've lost their jobs and therefore lose their medical insurance, or as is the case in African countries, most people don't yet have medical insurance, so people have to pay out of pocket. And if you lose your livelihood, then you cannot pay for, for health care. So, and then other factors that influence health going into the future, nutrition, access to good food. It is going to have an impact not only now, but also going into, into the medium term, into the future. African countries are going to be struggling with their financing for health because their economies are, are so severely affected by this uh, by the pandemic and therefore this is going to have wholesale impact on uh, on health not only now but uh, going into the future doreen do you want to say like things are done khadija do you have another question doreen is, is does anyone want to talk you know you, you feel free to talk to each other guys I mean, uh, sorry. after you doreen <laughs> Okay, okay. Personally, I just want to highlight something that has come up uh, that I've actually noticed during this pandemic. The stigma that, and I, I, I want to tie it with the, the HIV factor. HIV currently has the issue of stigma and discrimination among people living with mm -hmm. HIV. And we have seen it come out with the COVID-19 pandemic. We saw that at some point you were even afraid to sneeze or cough in public because you don't want to be termed that you have COVID-19. And people were, when, when COVID first started in Kenya, when we first recorded our first case, people were being taken to quarantine and it was almost looked, looked like a criminal kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And uh, the more days went by, the more people were like forced into some sort of quarantine. And you, you now feel like you're, you are not part of society, not an acceptable person because you might have COVID. So uh, I was, I, I'm just wondering, is there something that, that can be done uh, by governments, by healthcare institutions, so that we don't end up with another pandemic that has stigma come with it? Because mm -hmm. we all know the effects of stigma. They are not, they are just so adverse. I'm just going to summarize for our for our viewing audience, all of you watching online, you are so welcome. This is Dear World Live, a very important conversation about healthcare inequality, both in countries and around the world. I am joined by a marvelous ensemble of guests uh, and we're having this discussion now. Khadija, I want to come to you, but I want you to add to what Doreen was saying and, and perhaps you've got a question for, for, for all of us, if we can get everyone on at the same time. Doreen is making a very valid point, folks. This idea of stigma, of fake news, of, of, of mm -hmm. talking about the vaccine in a term where people might not take it just because they don't know what's in it. That's a really important, important part of being a physician and providing healthcare and correct information. I want us to start thinking about that. But Khadija, do you have any more questions that you want to ask? 
Yeah, definitely. I think, especially with what Doreen has mentioned in terms of the stigma, that was a huge particular issue, especially at the beginning around when coronavirus was um, becoming such a big issue. When mm. it comes to spreading fake news, we all know about the WhatsApp broadcast messages to our parents, our grandparents, spreading a huge amount of fear amongst them. And it just goes to show that this is going to be a long road to actual gaining some sort of normalcy let's say um and things need to happen at a governmental level um but also in our healthcare systems so my next question would be how what are some of the solutions how do we try and fix some of these disparities that exist within healthcare caused by the racial mm. inequalities so, i mean uh, can i come in now Nila? i mean I, I think i was going to follow on to say i agree with um uh, what Dr. Moriti said about the economic impact, the issue of stigma is very important, but it comes back to government, which is what you've you've highlighted here, Khadija. I think there are two there are two um, tracks here. One is a longer term track, which is addressing the structural racism, and you know, if we're allowed to use that term, I think we should. Yeah, um, we should. That, that has got us into the position that we are now in many societies across the world. Mm. So. But, but that's a long-term fix of society, of institutions, uh, of politics, um, and that's an overhaul that needs to begin, and that requires very strong leadership. The second issue, the second track is the immediate challenge of what to do about COVID. And the frustration here um, is that the, let's take, uh, let's get, go back to racism and, 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 and the disparity in outcomes. Um, the evidence emerged very early. It's clear we know that minority communities are adversely affected. Uh, governments have that data, health services have that data, but what action are they really taking to address that? They are not taking the required action to address those inequalities immediately. Uh, in care. It's very, very frustrating. And, and I can say that's happening in the UK. It's, I'm sure it's happening and we know it's happening in the US as well and in other places. So uh, if we're looking to ad address the challenges that we have now, it's the governments, uh, the leaders of the health services that need to immediately prioritise the welfare of minorities uh, because they are most at risk from this pandemic mm -hmm. and they are not responding to the data and the evidence that we have that they are most at risk. So it's 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 a failure of leadership and that needs to be urgently tackled. I would yeah. like to thank Khadija for doing my job for me and asking to think about the solutions both on a macro and micro level. She obviously has access to my scripts that I didn't know about. Doreen, I want to come to you and then Dr. Mietti. Um, what can we do on an individual level and, and to what Dr. Abbasi said on, on, a, on a macro, on a wider level, I can't change government, but maybe there's something I can do personally that might make a difference. Doreen, let me come to you first and then have a think, Dr. Mietti, as to what you might say. Mm. Uh, you know, at the end of the day, it uh, boils down to you as a person, as an individual, how responsible are you? Uh, how well are you taking care of yourself? Because now we have a, a way where our healthcare systems even right now, they're already strained. And we have seen even most of the most uh, powerful healthcare systems in the world are very strained right now. So when it comes to a country like Kenya, where I'm speaking from, and uh, we already strained uh, when it comes to the medical professionals and practitioners, and we are even seeing that people in the front line, they're dying. So me as an individual, before I task the government that what are you doing for our doctors or what are you doing here and there, what am I doing? Am I, am I following the protocols that have been put in place? Am I following the safety measures that have been put in place? Am I taking care of myself and even my loved ones? Because we might blame the governments all we want, but at the end of the day, we also have a responsibility to play that I will go out and not uh, and, and ensure that I maintain social distance and ensure that I keep myself safe. I go out with a mask because uh, right now we have we have a pandemic on our hands that the whole world is struggling with. So you don't want to be part of the statistics that actually will be counted that we lost so and so to coronavirus. So you need to also have that individual responsibility that. I am going to keep myself safe and also the people around me safe. Dr. Mayetti. Um, yes, I, you know, I, of course, 
and you know, as yes, somebody who works on policy on uh, national strategies, I recognize that um, sometimes you can be waving evidence under the nose of politicians, and if some political imperative um, necessitates it, they will ignore it. So you know, evidence and uh, common sense don't always translate into appropriate policies and action. But I, I do believe that some of the things that we need to do as a World Health Organization, which we are doing all the time, I have to say, is to advise governments to base their actions on, um, on evidence and on determinants. So we need coalitions of groups that are going to look at influencing the way governments are behaving. I do, I do believe that there is something that citizens can do. The, the difference between HIV and um, COVID-19 I think is the speed at which it has unfolded. You know, I, like I said, I gave that example of the, in order to get a US president to shift the policy and doing something different, you, we had citizens, people who were affected, others who were supporting this work, WHO uh, and other organizations working together to persuade people, this is actually what's going on, do something based on these facts. So my, my response is to say we need different people. And I, I do believe it's possible. The, the BMJ, the, the British Medical Journal, which is a, an influential international journal, I'm sure you're writing about that, uh, the fact that what we see is actions that don't, that don't actually follow the data and therefore the impact is going to be limited or it's going to be inequitable as usual. I think it requires all of this. It requires those who can have influence. It requires citizens themselves. It requires uh, international organizations, perhaps to be less diplomatic than we normally are in addressing some of these factors. It really requires this collective action. And at the end of the day, uh, some of what we do is to show the political leaders what an, uh, you know, what, what a huge economic impact for everybody having these uh, inequities and vulnerabilities in certain groups are going to have. If you look at all the arguments that's, that are going on in Western countries now about lockdowns, it's not that everybody is affected equally, but you know, if, if, if proper attention is not paid, then the lockdowns are going to affect economies generally, apart from one, one industry, which is to do with keeping us connected as we speak. Khadija, I hope that that was a succinct and complete answer. We have Doreen talking about personal responsibility, Dr. Abbasi saying we need to oust these leaders that aren't doing quite enough uh, of what the public want. And Doreen, uh, uh, sorry, Dr. Uh, Mayetti being as uh, exactly as I expect, saying that it is all our collective responsibility and calling out Ronald Reagan as she should. Thank you to all of you guys. Um, uh, um, uh, Khadija, I'm gonna I'm gonna pause you for a moment because I've got a question for our three guests. So if we can just have our three guests for this next section, we've been reaching out and we have some wonderful questions from the uh, Qatar Medical Students Associations who have sent us multiple questions. I can't get through all of them right now, so I apologize. But we thank you for contributing. I will get to one question that I want my guests to think about. Ali Al Amji asks, nationalism and tribalism plays a huge role in the Middle East and all over the world. How can we promote healthcare workers to treat all patients equally? And I just want to build on that to say, uh, Khadija mentioned about um, the African-American community in, in the US uh, and the Bain community here in the UK, getting different levels of treatment. Racism does not stop, xenophobia does not stop once you put that white coat on. So talk to me a little bit about how we can, how we can mitigate um, that, uh, that xenophobia or racism. I wanna to come to you first, Dr. Abbasi. Yeah, I mean, this is the kind of $60 billion question or however much you want to attach to it. Uh, racism is something, <laughs> I mean, how do you remove it from people, from individuals? We've been trying to crack that nut for, for a very long time. I, 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 but but I, th I think the, what we have to do though is to is to look at the structural issues so that the society mm. the environment the culture everything that's made up address the things we can address be honest about it show leadership 
measure where those inequalities are, where that racism is, because we know racism is a factor on its own in, in, in people's outcomes. So we need to do those things. And then in terms of individuals, in, in terms of healthcare professionals, I, th I think what, A, we change the culture, B, I think it's about how you train people and how you, sh how you mentor them, how you show them with role models, how they're meant to behave with people from different backgrounds. Cause, because ultimately, as a health professional, your duty is to that person, that individual, regardless of race, religion, ethnicity, culture, sex, whatever. Uh, your duty is to help them. And, 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 and to train them. Dr. Abbasi, I'm so sorry to interrupt. The time has absolutely gotten away with me and we have barely moments left. So so you're, I, want, I want Dr. Muyeti to pick up on what you said. Your duty is to your patient and that is the most fundamental thing. Dr. Muyeti, with the little time that we have, I'm yes. sorry to, to, to force you to answer, but uh, what, what would you make of that? Yeah, no, I agree completely with, with Dr. Abbasi. And, and you know, both the structural racism and at the personal level, the unconscious biases. First, I think we need to name it. We need to actually say it is here, it's going on. And we need to learn to talk about it in ways that don't trigger uh, defensiveness in people, etc. So I, you know, I'm very, it, it's a strange coincidence that the Black Lives Matter um, movement coincided with this pandemic. And it's given the opportunity to actually talk more openly about racism that has been happening, uh, you know, in, in the last few decades. So I think we need to name it. And then we need to do what Dr. Abbasi said. I agree very much with it. Name it, Doreen. What do you think? In your experience as an as a HIV positive person, is naming a thing part of destroying that taboo in a sentence? I'm so sorry to rush you. <laughs> naming is a thing because, uh, sorry, but I, I always say uh, the H in HIV stands for human. So the minute that doctor wears their white coat, they have to look at that person as a human. It doesn't matter what color, what race, mm. what background they're coming from, look at them as a human being. Thank you so much. If we can get Khadija on as well, I would love to thank all of my guests for this exceptional, wonderful discussion that we have. We haven't solved the issue, but we started to talk about solutions. Mm -hmm. Dr. Matsudisto mm -hmm. Mayeti, Doreen Maracha, Cameron Abasi, and Khadija Uhusu. Thank you so much. Say goodbye, everybody. Okay, goodbye. Bye. <laughs> Thank you so much. And for those of you who are tuning in at Wish and our regular Dear World Live viewers, I am so thankful. I'm sorry I couldn't get to more of your questions. Um, very wonderful co comments and questions coming from all over the place. Dr. Govinda obviously liked it. Mohammed was watching from Sudan. We had people from the United States. Um, some people praising the diversity of our panel, which I'm always thrilled about. Um, and uh, lots of comments and questions. Thank you so much uh, for that. For those of you uh, who want to get more involved, uh, remember you can always go to dohadebates.com to see more from our show. That is it from Dear World Live and from this season of Dear World Live. You can catch up on our website. Thank you to Wish and from the Doha Debates team. That's all from me. Goodbye. Thank you.